with uh, the brewing organisation which is called SEBA. Uh, it was the Small Independent Brewers Association but they've changed the name and kept the acronym um, many times since then. Um, in our first year we picked up uh, several awards. Um, no goals though. Then we went back in the following year and uh, we picked up some gold awards for the vacant gesture along with several other awards for the other beers that we do which took us to the national uh, stage where we took the uh, gold across the whole country for the vacant gesture in bottle. Unfortunately, as you may know, the Idle Valley concept didn't work out. It was difficult to work with an egomaniac, so they, they, they didn't want to work with me anymore. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, um, this meant that we had to liquidate the whole company. So after a long drawn out legal battle, we were left with no brewery and uh, basically no money in the bank and no pub. So we decided to get back up off the floor, if you like, and uh, put what little money that we could lay our hands on into opening the brew shed, as was um, the micro micro pub, if you like, uh, at 108 Carrollgate. This allowed us then to bring in a little bit of revenue to try and rebuild what we'd lost in the previous year, 2017. So, we didn't have enough money to buy any tanks. We didn't have enough money to buy any prefabricated kits. We just about managed to scrape together enough cash to buy some stainless steel and some slip rollers and a welder. So I decided that we were going to take the plunge and uh, roll our own tanks, make our own kit and build it all from scratch. But you're not an engineer? No, I you're trained myself. From yes. DIY. It was a bit of a risk, yeah. <laughs> so I've done a little bit of welding before, but uh, nothing on this scale. So we bought the slip rollers, which are nestled at the bottom of the stairs there. Uh, they cost about 1,200 quid. And that, along with the steel, emptied the bank account for us. So I spent the next 100 days uh, teaching myself how to weld, rolling the tanks, making models, scale models, to make sure I got everything correct. And slowly but surely, um, we started to put some tanks together. At the same time, we also renovated this building. It had had a wood yard in here before, 
furniture manufacturers. And everything was covered in sawdust, the walls were soaking wet through, the floor was a mess. Uh, so we started to repair the whole thing and get it looking somewhat presentable to put a food production uh, facility in there, if you like. Uh, so after the 100 days, we had the tanks looking very much like the tanks behind you. They weren't clad, they had no electrics, uh, no pipe work on them or anything like that. So we knew that we'd got over the first hurdle and over the next month or two, we consolidated the money that we were earning in the brew shed. We invested that back in to buy the fittings, the electrics, the timber, <clears throat> and everything else that we needed to make it a fully functional brewery. Um, the first brew, I think it was August 2018, um, it was a bit of a failure. Uh, I wouldn't say I was rusty, but uh, I'd had a bit of time off brewing, so what we had to do is take all the recipes that I had previously and scale them to this size of kit. So at Idle Valley I was brewing um, on a 2,000 litre kit, 10 barrel kit. Well, 1630 is 10 barrels, but we had a little bit less space. Um, that meant we could produce 40 firkins of beer per brew. These tanks hold 12 firkins. So we're about two and a little bit barrels, commercial brewer's barrels. Um, the first, like I said, the first brew happened in around August, and the very first one that we made, we actually ticked down the drain. I didn't think it was good enough to go on sale, so it's not really a difficult decision if the beer's not right. So we tipped it. The second one, being called Guile One, a little bit of uh, artistic license on that, <laughs> the first one that we sold. Um, I wasn't really happy with that, to be honest, but it was a good beer, and after we'd sam everyone had sampled it, we sold it, and then uh, we sort of got used to the kit a little bit more. Uh, even though I built it, you still have to understand all the intricacies and how everything's going to come through, the whole process, your volumes, um, how much bitterness you're going to get from the hops, all this is dependent on how the kit performs on any given brew day. <clears throat> So uh, we started to brew the old beers that we had previously at Iron Valley. The bacon gesture came back, uh, we've done the coconut shine, the English bitter was the talking expression. And uh, just last week I brewed the Jacob Pioneer for the first time on this kit. So we're not going to call it the Jacob Pioneer though, it's going to be Harrison Pale. So a lot of the beers that we do sell at the uh, brew shed, they are old recipes from Iron Valley, but we've just put the Harrison's Brewery prefix on them. Change the name. The only name that we've kept really is uh, is the bacon gesture because it was so popular, and it's kind of got a bit of a cult following. With you know people recognise it immediately. It's one of our most popular beers. <clears throat> so that's the history of where we are today. Uh, we're always continuing to innovate, uh, trying to improve the kit, which is why you can smell paint. I uh, painted the floor recently because we had a bit of downtime, so. We were able to do that. But every week when we're not brewing, we're either making something, improving something. Um, we're just building a cold room as well at the moment behind you. That's going to be up and running for the summer months, fingers crossed. We don't want the beer to get warm, because the heat is the enemy of beer. Um, so, yeah, that's where we are. So, what I thought I'd do as well is talk to you a little bit about the brewing process while I've got a captive audience. Um, I'm sure many of you being beer enthusiasts may have brewed at one point or another, may have, may not have, certainly drank some beer, if nothing else. So you may be familiar with the process, but I'll just run through it again for you, because otherwise I'm going to have nothing else to say. <laughs> so, beer starts with four ingredients, we've got water, we've got malt, we've got hops, and we've got yeast. These four ingredients allow us to Produce this wonderful uh, thousand year old beverage. Not always have hops in it. That's, uh, that's been a recent addition, sort of two or three hundred years ago. But it really is the hops and what we do with the grains that gives us a huge combination of different beers. More, than, more, more flavour profiles than what you get through uh, wine, for instance, which is probably why it's such a popular drink. So at the start of the brew day, <clears throat> we'll fill the HRT, which is this tank at the back. It's a little bit small at the minute. I could do with a bigger one. 
that was one of the first tanks that I made as well. So because it's only ever going to hold water, I was well aware that uh, there was not going to be any kind of chemical attacks on any weak spots in the, in the steel or anything like that if I cocked it all. Uh, so yeah, we fill the HLT with water, we heat it to a specific temperature. That temperature dictates the sweetness that we're going to get out of the beer. That, that kind of dictates what, uh, what body, what character we're going to get in the beer by choosing this specific temperature. So let's say we strike in at 80 degrees in the morning. Also depending on the beer, we'll add some water treatment, some salts. Uh, called burtonizing the water if you want to hit a burton profile. But lots of other breweries may replicate a, uh, a water profile from somewhere such as Dublin if they want to make some porters or stouts. You've all heard of Guinness. So what we've got here is uh, some calcium chloride and some calcium sulfate. These basically just change the chemistry of the water, increasing uh, free calcium ions. I don't want to get too technical, but that allows the enzymes in the, uh, in the barley to do their work. So the barley has been malted when it's come from the field. This is a process of germination, which starts the biological activity within the grain. We're basically tricking it into thinking that it's growing. And what it does, it takes all of the starches that are in the grain, um, and it activates the end, something called an endosperm. Like I said, I don't want to get too technical on it. But we trick it into growing. We trick it into growing, and then we roast it. So we halt that, halt that uh, growing process. So the barley is basically in stasis, but it's got all that nutrient in there ready to go. And then we as brewers reactivate it in the mash tun to get the enzymes in this endosperm going and turning all of the starch, which is in the barley grain, into sugar, which is what we want. Yeast don't eat starch, yeast only eat sugar, so we need sugar, maltose essentially. So um, once we've got the mash, our grist bill, our grain bill, uh, we want to add a little bit of character to this sweet uh, liquor that we're going to make. It's called words, sweet words at this point. <coughs> so before the mash, we might add some other grains. So these are all grains that have gone through various uh, killing processes. So your base malt makes up the bulk up to 100%, usually around 90% of the mash. And then all of these other uh, malts are roasted to give you different characters, like Cara, for instance, will give you slight toffee notes in there. The dark Cara, roasted a little bit more, you might get a little bit more treacle from that one. Or you go as far forwards as some dark crystal, you might get some raisin flavours from that. Pretty much everything you can think of um, on the malt side of a beer comes from the combination of grains that we put into it. You can even use uh, other grains that aren't barley, we can put oats in for instance, or some wheat. Is it the same barley grain that you use? The same yes. variety of barley? Yeah, or so the, the variety um, can change depending <coughs> on the farmer, or it's a supply and demand thing. But essentially, let's say Marisotto, which is a well-known uh, base mold, they will also use that in their roasting process as well. So they'll take the, uh, the barley, and when they're kilning it, they just stop it at various points. So we'll stop it very early in the process where it's very pale, hence the name pale malt, and then that's bagged and shipped, ready to go. And then with some of the others, they might roast them a little bit longer to develop the color, to develop the flavor. And then when you get into the crystal malts, what's happened is they've roasted them that much, they lose all of the enzymes, the enzymes have been destroyed, and the starches begin to turn into sugars. They, be, they begin to transform on their own. And uh, they no longer, you can't use them to make beer with. They're now flavor additions. You couldn't just mash a load of black malt, for instance, and make a beer from it, because you wouldn't be able to make any sugars for the yeast. It's just what's captured in there. <coughs> so yeah, it's the same variety or same malt as what the base malt is. And it's the same whether you want to roast oats or anything like that as well. They do the same thing, you can get crystal, crystallized oats and whatnot. So which one you use for the bacon? So for the bacon, <laughs> we use around 90% uh, uh, pale malt, uh, a little bit of 
Cara 10, which is like Cara, Cara 10. And then we also add some wheat, a fair percentage of wheat. And the wheat is what gives it its little haze, and it also uh, helps with head retention, gives it a little bit of body. So, torrified? Sorry? Is it torrified wheat? No, no, it's wheat malt. So, uh, torrified wheat is basically, uh, it's rolled. It's the kind of thing that you see in rabbit food. Squash, sorry? Sugar puffs. Yeah, sugar puffs, yeah. So, uh, no, we use, we use malted wheat, so they've gone through the same germination process with the wheat as they have for the barley, whereas torrified wheat is just straight out the field and then it's pushed through heated rollers um, and that kind of does the job. Wheat doesn't have any enzymes in it, by the way. So you can't make a wheat beer without any barley. You just end up with a glass of starch. So you need the alpha and the beta enzymes from the barley to, to catalyze this process. Um, so yeah, we've got the water and the water treatment and the grains in the mash tun. The mash tun's got a false bottom in it so it doesn't all disappear out the tap when we open it. We'll fill it up with water, we'll hold it at a specific temperature and we'll let that mash go on for about 60 minutes generally. It can be anything between zero minutes and two or three hours, depending on the type of beer. But as a rule, it's 60 minutes for us. That gives the uh, enzymes enough time to work on the starch and do its job. Then after we've done that, we want to separate the liquid from the solid. So we do something called a vol-off. It's a German word, and I'm not going to try and spell it. So we basically hook up a tap to the bottom of the tank send it through a pump and sprinkle it back into the top of the tank and then we're going to use the grain, the husk of the grain, as a filter. So as the liquid trickles through, it rinses all the white bits in here, all, all dissolved into sugars and you're just left with the husk and the husk acts as a filter bed so as the, uh, as the sweet water's running through it, it gets clear and it's clearer than the beer that you're drinking now when it comes out of the, uh, out of the mash tun if it's done correctly. We don't want to drag any solids across. So is that the same as sparging? No, sparging comes just afterwards. So the vol off um, is there simply to compact the grain bed and uh, start everything moving. And then we immediately, normally have vol off for 15 minutes, and then we immediately move on to sparging. So the HLT has still got the hot water in it, sat at around 80 degrees. So we'll take that hot water and we'll sprinkle it onto the top of the grain bed and uh, at the same time start to pull the sweet wort out of the bottom of the mash tun into the boil kettle. So as the sweet wort's coming down in the mash tun and we're sprinkling hot water on the top, it's rinsing the grains as it comes through. So eventually once we've rinsed all of the sweetness and all the sugars and all the goodness out of these grains into the mash tun, <coughs> and diluted it to a certain extent because you can see that tank's not as big as this tank <coughs> but when it comes out of there it's really concentrated, really sweet it's this stuff, I know I've got it out for a reason <laughs> so uh, that's the mash and that's been sat, I put this in at one o'clock so it's been sat, it's ready to go and uh, it tastes really, really sweet Really nice. If anyone wants to dip the finger in that, we've got food. It's right. Um, but yeah, it is lovely. And uh, once we've got that separated and transferred into the boil kettle, we want to start. Quite uh, fruity. Well, I think it's like Horlicks. It basically is Horlicks the malt. So yeah, we're rinsing this grain through. We're transferring it all into the boil kettle. This is where the brewing starts, essentially, the next stage. We're going to start to boil this liquid now. A couple of reasons. One, it's come from the field. You know, it's that little mice and stuff running all over it, isn't it? We, we want to make sure that we've sterilised it before we take it any further into the process. So the boiling sterilises it for one. So you could just boil it, put it into a fermenter, add some yeast, and you'd have a beer, but it wouldn't taste quite right, so it's not balanced. You need some bitterness in there to counteract the sweetness. So what we do is we have hops. Uh, these grow on a vine. I've just planted some in the beer garden, actually, at the back, so you'll be able to see them this year. We might have <coughs> a harvest this year, but next year we should. The hops 
bring a lot to the table. Um, aroma, bitterness, uh, flavour, very important addition, um, otherwise we'd be using stuff like, uh, I think it's called hot water or something, and mm -hmm. you know, all these other herbs and spices that they used to put in beer to try and add this bitterness. But this is brilliant. If you want to pass them round, you'll notice the two labels on the front indicate what kind of hop it is. The East Kent Goldings is UK heritage grown, obviously, in East Kent. But you can get Goldings from other parts of the world. They just can't get the East Kent prefix. We use this in the bitter. It's earthy. It, uh, it's a good bittering hop. But if we're going to use it at the end of the boil, it brings like a nice earthy aroma to it. And these are the mosaic hops that we use in the vacant gesture. These are from the States. You should recognise them immediately. If you want to pass them around and have a snifter, I think it smells fantastic. I have in the past. So, hops come into uh, types, if you like, for the brewer. Uh, all the processing is done on the hot pot. <laughs> so, uh, when the hops grow on the vine, they are flower cones, if you like. So, what the uh, hop merchants do, they pull the vines down, they send them through a giant picker, it's got fingers on it, and they just pick all the hops off the vines, and they go and they kill them. They dry the hops out and it's kill it takes several days, and then they'll, uh, they'll pack them into bales, huge bales, I mean the size of a, of a silage bale. Big fellas, and uh, they're ready for sale. Some brewers can't process those hops because there's too much vegetable matter. It's too bulky. It's certainly too bulky. Uh, it's bulky and difficult to store. So what they'll do, they'll run it through a hammer mill, and the hammer mill compacts, separates, crushes up all these hop cones, and then they'll be forced through a die. And they'll be turned into the pellets that you see in the glass. Very reminiscent of like uh, sheep food or something like that, if you can imagine that kind of pellet. <laughs> the convenience for me <clears throat> with the hot pellets is that I don't have to have a man weight on the boil kettle to get all of the leftovers out. I can flush them straight out of the valve at the bottom. Uh, I can also flush them straight into uh, the municipal sewage system and they can deal with them up there. That's not a problem. Um, and I don't have to dispose of them myself. Uh, they're also more convenient to store because they're in a more compact version. Uh, well, we do a certain amount of filtering in the kettle, so we're not... Uh, you will separate. Yeah, so we will pull. Yeah. And what that does, it creates a vortex in the middle, which allows all the solid particles, after you've settled the whirlpool, to settle into the centre, and then we draw off the beer from the side of the tank, leaving it behind. Whereas if you're going to brew with whole hops, then lots of brewers use the hops actually as a filter. So very much the same way as what we did with the, uh, with the grain, the hops will sort of sit around the, the takeoff valve in the boil kettle, and that'll act as a filter and a dam to keep back any other proteins and drug that we've put in there or have found the way in there. So yeah, it's a convenience thing for me. That's why we use hot pellet. Uh, they are a little bit more expensive to buy generally for the same crop year because they've had a little bit more processing done. But, for instance, that is five kilos of hot pellet. I don't have any uh, leaf hopping, but the leaf hop bags, boxes are usually this. So, loads of space saved. Um, so yeah, we've got the hops in there. We decide how much hops we want to put into the beer when the beer's boiling, or beforehand, depending on the brewer. Uh, dependent on the alpha acids of the hops and dependent on the target bitterness of the beer that we want to achieve at the end of the day. So for the item, we'll get pretty much as much out of it as we can. Uh, so I achieve that IBU limit. If I start the other way, I wait all my IBUs and if I put any flavour additions in, I'm going to be overshooting my bitterness profile. So we've, uh, we've got the hops in. We've boiled for an hour or so, let's say. We've done a hop stand for the flavour additions. We've let it whirlpool at 80 degrees. We've put our aroma additions in. That's sat for half an hour normally for me. And uh, 
as it's sat there, that whirlpool's all settling out at the bottom. So what we'll start to do then is uh, pull the beer off through something called a plate heat exchanger, which is this big blue thing in the corner for those of you that can see it. Basically the kind of thing that you've got in a boiler. So beer goes one way, water comes the other way, and they swap the heat. So we put cold water in and red hot beer in, in opposing flows, and out the other end comes cold beer and hot water. Yes, so we save that water, because uh, it's expensive to heat water up. So we'll put that into the HLT, and that's ready for tomorrow's beer. And then generally what I try and do, at the minute we've got three tanks running, so if I'm gonna brew, I brew three days in a row. So I come in in the morning, I've already got my hot water ready for the next one. Hopefully when those tanks behind you are commissioned, and we can do eight brews in a row, which means I'll have a long working week. <laughs> in other words, you've got your work cut out. I, I always have, I. Uh, so yeah, we're going to exchange the heat now, uh, harvest that energy back into the HLT, and we want to get the beer at pitching temperature. So uh, we're going to have the yeast, many, many types of yeast on the market, and again, these will change the, the, the character of the beer when you put them in. Uh, for our bitter, because I like to keep it English, we've got English hops in there, we've got English malts, so we use an English yeast. There's a caveat to that, they manufacture it in Canada. But <laughs> it's not in a male yeast, the, the strain is originally from around here. And uh, for the bacon, we use either uh, US05, which is an American West Coast strain, very clean, very crisp, very little residual yeast flavour, or this new AEB yeast that has come onto the market, which I'm trialling at the minute. So we've got AEB in one tank and USO5 in the other. So if that works and I can do the switch, it's 20 quid a block cheaper than the SO5 stuff. So you always use cross. dry yeast? Sorry? You always use dry yeah, yeast? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I've done wet pitching before and harvesting, but on the scale that we're at here, <laughs> And because I've only got the three tanks, I don't want to be storing yeast for yeah. several days. If you're brewing daily, you could do it. Absolutely. So when we've got all eight of these tanks up and running, I'll probably be able to half uh, yeah. my yeast consumption because I'll have to dry pitch in tank one, two, and three. And then on day four, 90% of the fermentation is done in tank one, and I'll be able to draw some yeast off and pitch in tank four or five. So I'll be able to save a little bit like that. But I've done it in the past. Um, when are you checking your specific gravity? You know, when you went from the match tun to the boil? Yeah, good point. You I missed that. Do a check there. Yes, so uh, in order to determine what alcohol we want <coughs> in the finished beer, uh, we want to analyse how much sugar is in the liquid. Um, so there's a couple of ways that we can do that. We can either cool it quickly and use a hydrometer. I've got some over there, but they're like they're 100 pound each and I don't want to break them so I haven't got them out or we can use something called a refractometer which makes you look like a pirate every time you uh, want to, to read it <laughs> so you put a few drops of the sugary liquid on here and uh, through refraction it'll tell you how much sugar is in that solution these are good because you don't need a lot of sample size and they cool down instantly as soon as you put it on the glass <coughs> so when we're bringing, I'll just backtrack a little bit, when we're bringing the sweet work across into the boil kettle, if we want a 4% beer, we're looking for a target gra gravity of around 1040 in specific gravity units, roughly. So as we're going and transferring, I'll be tracking that sugar level all the time. It might start right up at 1080, 1090, and the more we're bringing out, the more we're diluting it, and it starts to come down, and as soon as we hit 1040, well, actually, it's a little bit lower because I'm going to boil it and concentrate it. So let's say we get 1037, cut off. No not matter how much water's left in here, I'll just tip that down the drain. I don't need that anymore. I've hit my target. So then I'll boil it, and when I finish the 60-minute boil, it'll creep up to 1040. You get to know if you're going to hit it or not. Sometimes you miss your targets a little bit, so you have to declare a different ABV on your duty sheet. It happens. I think of uh, brewing beer a little bit like herding sheep. And they always want to go over here to eat some grass. I'll bring them back a little bit. And then they go over this way. I've got to bring them back a bit. So every stage in the process, you, you, it's none of it's direct, none of it's linear. You just always have to keep buffering it to keep it on track. What's your going? Problem with the sheep 
Yeah, I'm the sheepdog. <laughs> the brewer's the sheepdog. Uh, the brewer doesn't really make any beer. The yeast makes the beer, you know. We just, we're, like you said, we're the dog in the old situation. And glorified cleaner as well, all we do. Would that change the flavour if you didn't do that? You let the strength of the wall go high. Yeah. You're going to get stronger beer. Would it make a big difference? Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> the more sugar you've got in a beer, uh, before you set out to ferment to achieve this alcohol target, uh, that means you'll have more residual sugars left behind as well. So the more sugars you've got left behind, they'll not balance as you expect them to with the bitterness that you've got <coughs> from the hops. So you'll end up with an unbalanced beer when you're drinking it, it'll be, it'll be either too <coughs> sweet or too bitter. <coughs> So you sort of need to hit your targets on the, on the gravity points for your ABV because not only does it throw your ABV out, it throws your bitterness profile out as well. Yeah. So you have to kind of just, you're chasing your tail with it all the time. But if you're doing commercial brewing and you're making the same beer week after week, you get to learn what's going to happen. It's pretty, okay. do it with your hands behind your back eventually. That's where the fun is in brewing the beers that you've never made before, you see. Yeah. Because you don't know what's uh, what's going to happen, and then also, if it goes wrong, you don't have to do that. You know, that was what I was trying to achieve. Now, you know, it's your recipe, right? I think if it was you being chased down by a VAT man, that's why you try and hit it as opposed to letting the flavour run. Now, with the the alcohol content of the beer, <coughs> we pay something called beer duty, and uh, that's calculated on the ABV per hectolitre. Hectolitre percent. Complicated. They've made it. It's HMRC. They make it as complicated as they can. Um, so if you make uh, a beer which is stronger than what you intended, that's not a problem as long as you declare that strength in HMRC and pay the relevant duty increase on it. So they don't charge duty on beers that are any lower than 2.5% ABV, and anything higher than 7.5% ABV, there's a £5.96 per hectolitre percent surcharge. So if you're drinking the heavy strong beers, they're expensive because there's more alcohol in there and a lot more duty on top of it as well. Uh, so, we've got the beer out of the tank, we've got it into the fermenter, we're going to add the yeast. I sprinkle it on top, some people stir it, some people mix it into a jug and make it wet and put it in whatever floats your boat really. Uh, sprinkling it on top seems to work for me. And then we set the temperature on the tanks, the temperature is controlled uh, two ways. It's heated by blankets. Believe it or not, they are uh, blankets that you heat your bed with that I put from Argos and I wrapped them around the tank before I put the cladding on. <laughs> or they're cooled uh, by glycol. So you'll see on a couple of the tanks behind you there's a panel on the side. So we send cold glycol through that effectively and that cools the tank. So we've got behind Dave here is a box with a plastic box inside it and then a it's actually a, um, an AC unit in the glycol. Uh, it's just a Keith Robinson affair, like. Oh, you're well, it's yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's not too bad. I mean, glycol uh, is very sweet and it doesn't ferment, so you, you taste it straight away. Uh, and in the brewing industry, we have to use monopropylene glycol, which is non toxic anyway, so if you did get it in your beer, which you won't. <laughs> Some people do, some brewers do. The benefit of using dry yeast is that when the yeast goes into hibernation whilst they're drying it, it brings all the, uh, the nutrients and oxygen that it needs into its uh, cell wall. So when you rehydrate the beer, or the, the yeast, sorry, it's ready to go. So uh, it can get into its, uh, its multiplication phase and start breeding or cell dividing. Um, if we were to harvest the yeast and then use it in another batch, I'd want to add some oxygen then, yeah, because we're not adding, oxygen's a big enemy of beer, but yeast need oxygen uh, in the cell wall so they can divide. So, uh, as brewers, we're also yeast farmers, so we put a, half of one of these goes into a tank, and at the end of it, I get almost a bucket full of yeast that I need to get rid of, so we farm yeast. So, uh, it's in the tank, it's being controlled uh, thermally by the glycol and the, and the heating element, Generally, what happens is the beer starts to run away because there's a biological process going on inside. It wants to get hot. So we do very little heating here. Only in the middle of winter do we have the heaters on. Generally, they're cooling. I ferment the beers 
around 18 and a half degrees. I think that a slightly lower temperature helps with any off flavours, prevents you getting any, uh, any nasty esters in there that uh, can change the, the flavour of the beer. Some brewers ferment as high as 23, 24 degrees. Well, yeah. <laughs> Different style of beer though, isn't it? Yeah. Um, they don't make very interesting flavours. Yeah, they don't make many real ales, definitely. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, for, for ale, yeah. Uh, for me, 18 and a half seems good. Lager brewers ferment as low as 12 degrees, 14. Uh, bottom fermenting yeast, different strain altogether. It's not sacrosanct, uh, whatever it is. It's not that <laughs> same strain yeah. of yeast. Um, so yeah, like I said earlier, yeast is uh, it's quite a varied animal. There's lots of different strains out there that will give you different effects uh, depending on what your final product wants to be, what the tavern is. Uh, after the beer's fermented in the tanks for generally around five days for me, then uh, all the fermentation is pretty much complete. So we'll start to charge it with a dry hop addition. So again, we're going back into the hops, and this is where you want the expensive uh, American hops, which have got all the aroma in them. Uh, you want to be putting them in at the dry up stage, not the boil stage. Because if you boil these hops, you're just boiling all that money up the chimney. So the mosaic for the bacon gesture goes in at day five. We do two charges. Half of the hops go in for five days. The other half goes in for three days. And then after that uh, five day dry hop process, which happened on Thursday, uh, I'll add some auxiliary findings which are the vegan friendly ones, and we'll set the tanks to crash, to cool. Normally I'll shoot for four degrees C, um, and these aren't cooling at the minute because uh, the tank, the, the uh, AC unit's loud, so I didn't want to wash myself out, you know, with that running. But yeah, pretty much these tanks will get down to uh, four degrees in a day or so. One or two of them are a little bit slower, depends, you know, some of them rob the heat from others, vice versa. Uh, the reason we're cooling the beer at this time is uh, to allow all of the ingredients, the sediment and everything that we put in the yeast to settle out to the bottom of the tank because we don't want it. So uh, a couple of days crashed to four degrees, we're pretty much ready to package them. I'm going to pull some out and show you what it looks like. What's that sat at? Seven degrees. This has been cooling for a couple of days. So is that about then? This is ready to go into packaging, but it's not, uh, it's ready to drink, but it's not clear, as you can see. And we'll get some of the bacon out as well. This is what Frank Hall want, I'd imagine. <laughs> I'm going to take a bit out, because there's some glass here for you to sample it if you want to later on. Uh, so this is the Jaded Pioneer, or the Harrison to Pale, as it's going to be in the future, and that's the bacon gesture. And uh, they've had two days cold crashed, and they're already still that cloudy. Um, but they will clear in the cask on their own, given time, or I'm quite happy to drink from AZ personally. Uh, but some people want a crystal clear beer. They want to see through it. They've been conditioned by the big brewers, to believe that clear beer is the only way to serve beer. So they put this stuff in. This is called Isinglass Findings, made from the swim bladder of a fish. Right, yeah. <laughs> if you want this in your beer, I'll put it in for you, but have a sniff of that. I hate the stuff, it's horrible. It's expensive, it shortens the shelf life of your beer, and it stinks. But some people want fine ales, so. <laughs> yeah. No, the big ones, they all look like this. So, like our scout, for instance, it's a dark beer, so unless you shine a torch through it, you can't see that it's hazy. I don't put any eyes in glass in that. I don't want eyes in glass in any of my beers, frankly. You can, yeah. So, we use something called uh, auxiliary finings, which is a silicate. And uh, that goes into the tank. Uh, as, we, as we cold crash, but the trouble is that doesn't do the job in completion. That will only attract ne negatively charged particles 
whereas the isinglass will work on the positively charged ones. Whereas you do use them both, then over the course of the fining process, you're going to drag all of those fine particles out of the beer. Uh, there are other oh, egg whites often used. Gelatin can be used to a lesser extent. In fact, uh, isinglass um, turns into gelatin uh, through its uh, degradation process. Uh, so yeah, we're going to package the beer now. So, well, here's a good example. This has been fined, and that one hasn't. It's the same beer, same tank, and you can see the effect on the tap. You can see the particles falling out. So a couple of days, and you can get crystal clear beer from this. And that's just with auxiliary filings? No, this is auxiliary. That's got eyes and glass in it. Ah. But if it was given to 48 hours, the auxiliary would start to drop yeah. on the bacon yeah. that you're drinking now. It'll start them in the bag. Exactly. Yeah, time's your friend. Yeah. And there's also a bit of time in there as well. They'll start to compact the sediment bed in the cask itself and it gives the beer time to, uh, to condition. So there's still going to be a little bit of residual sugars in there and they provide a little bit of gas, a bit of CO2 for the beer to help protect it in its package. And also, um, beer has like a bell curve on it, I find. So as soon as it comes out of the tank, you can taste that it's green. Give it a couple of weeks and try it. And that flavour profile's on the up. You're like, oh, that's way better than it was two weeks ago. You know, you want to get stuck into it. But wait, wait another couple of weeks and it's even better. But if you wait a couple of three months, then it starts yeah. to come down on the other side of the bell curve. Uh, we package in cask and keg at the brewery at the minute. Um, most of my awards, believe it or not, were on bottled beers, and I'm not bottling at the minute, but that's because I've got my hands full of other things. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the difference between cask and keg is we put CO2 into the beer when we keg it. It, can, it comes out the same tank, through the same hose, the kegs and the casks are washed on the same washer. The only difference is when we filled the cask up, we stick one of them in the top, and when we fill the keg up, we just hook it up to some CO2 and give it a couple of days. It's the same beer, it's not been filtered. You know, it's not had a, been pasteurised, it's not had anything taken out of it, it's just had a little bit of gas put into it. The way I look at it, the beer doesn't know whether that CO2 has come from a yeast cell or a bottle. CO2 is CO2, you know, not the most. So then we're ready to uh, send it to the pub, which is not my domain because I don't like working in the bar. <laughs> I'd rather be on the other side of it. Uh, so yeah, we uh, send it to the pub, they'll put the casks in the cellar for a couple of days, They'll vent them. There'll be a little bit of release of this uh, this gas that's built up from the conditioning phase. It's what a lot of uh, uh, tapsters will call the secondary fermentation in the cellar, uh, and then it's down to the tapster or the uh, the seller of beer to determine when that beer is ready to go on the bar. And uh, everybody's got their own little <coughs> qualms about the whole thing. Like I say, I'm quite happy to just drink it some of the open room. Uh, but yeah, that's it. That's the brewing process. Uh, and that pretty much concludes all I've got to say. Can I ask a question now? You certainly can. Uh, right, perhaps a appropriate moment. I've been drinking your taking the pit. Yes. And uh, initially I thought, wow. And then when I ordered another one, I thought, I like this. I'm still drinking it. Can you explain? Did anything go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that beer, I was the target profile was a New England IPA for me, which is a really juicy kind of beer, but really hazy. Um, I didn't put any hops into the boil. I put all the hops into the whirlpool at 80 degrees, and I've done the calculations. And I, I forget what target IBU I was shooting for, but I thought the middle of the range for an IPA wasn't going to be too bitter. Um, we fermented it, it looked great, smelled fantastic. And at the end of the process, we tried it, and I was like, wow, that's too bitter. So I don't drink, I don't like it, it's too bitter for me. Uh, but I let a lot of other people try it, and people like Dave, for instance, have come to me and they've said, that's a nice beer. Mm. So I've told between rock and hard place because I'm thinking I don't like it 
but all the people do like it. So, so uh, yeah, I thought it's, it's too good a beer to throw down the drain. So we'll put it on the bar, and uh, you know, if people don't like it, they won't drink it. It's as simple as that. You didn't put a bittering pop in. Uh, there was no bittering additions. No. So it, only bitterness came from Whirlpool. That's in right. 80. Yes. Yeah. Which is surprising, yeah. but I did put 16 grams per litre in there, which, to give you an idea, usually around three or four grams a litre for a whole yeah. batch. Yeah. So I went with that. <laughs> Just one other question, Harry, and then I'll disappear. Uh, You're cleaning up with me. You talked about, you know, uh, moving on from Ormbrook to where you are now, uh, you did your initial investigations and your research, and you, you're working up your quantities, mm -hmm. you know, from your own brew. I mean, our brew, 40 pints, and it was 100 grams of the box. Yeah. Do you do it pro rata? No, it's not because linear. Because if you did, it would just be as strong as hell, wouldn't it? Yeah, so this is where the, uh, the software comes in for me. I cheat a little bit with it, you know. Like I say, I, I'm not a classically trained brewer. I'm a home brewer who's just having a dabble at it. Um, so. The way I look at it is, uh, the information's out there, so I'll just act as a sponge. If somebody knows how to do it, you know, I'm gonna take it on board, and then we'll try it, and we'll trial it, and if it's not quite to the tasting, this is the glory of doing batch one, batch two, or V1, V2, V3. You can just let the beer evolve as you can keep going. So, if it is too bitter, or too malty, or too strong, mm -hmm. The next time you brew it, you can just tweak it a little bit. You can still do some of the home brew to refine your recipes. Well, it takes me exactly the same time to make a beer at home. I've got the kit still, yeah. uh, as it does to do one commercially. So at the minute, I'm in the, the point of view of, well, if I'm going to have a play, which is what taking the pith was, yeah. uh, I may as well play and just fill up a dozen casks while I'm at it. Yeah. Uh, well, the worst case scenario is I'll have to tip it down the drain and I've lost a day's work. But that will only come if I've really messed up or there's an infection. Yeah. Generally, I'm not diving in so far <coughs> to do something so off the wall yeah. that it's going to be undrinkable immediately. I kind of know the limits already and I can start pushing them, if you know what I mean. And on that instance, I think I just went a little bit too far with the bitterness. So what I'm going to do next time, so I will brew it again, I'm just going to drop the whirlpool temperature down to 60 degrees and see if we get less. IBU extraction, we'll see. Might have dropped it a little bit lower just to be on the safe side. But what I don't want is a really sweet beer because I don't like sweet beers. I like them to be balanced. So. I want you to carry on making that. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a good six Perkins in there, mate, so we can save them for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, what we're going to do is, uh, Gemma's here somewhere, we're going to pour some of this out for anyone who wants, who's brave enough to try it straight from the tanks. Yeah. And uh, if everyone's going to go back into the brew shed now, I'll remind you, uh, this was put on today because uh, the camera branch wanted to come over from Newark. Um, so if you aren't a camera member, you're able to sign up in the brew shed and you'll get 10 pence off every pint of real ale that you buy. So if you're a regular, you'll quickly earn that sign up feedback. So uh, that's the best. Sorry? 20 pence on a Monday. Oh, you know that. <laughs> 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 but yeah, thanks, folks. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
and Gemma managed to press record again and now the battery light's blinking at me so it was definitely a long talk right so the camera cut out on me again uh, the battery died it was a long talk this is what's left of the brewery tour and uh, what an absolute roaring success it was as well folks I even went as far as doing a freaking mini mash for everybody they absolutely loved it I'm really impressed that I got through it without tripping up. Uh, I did lose my thread once or twice, I'll be honest with you, and I was very nervous speaking to kind of 30, 40 people in one go. But having all of these visual aids in front of me allowed me to just look down and immediately pick up my train of thought because I knew 
process inside and out, so it's very natural for me. I'm gonna go and have a pint now, folks. I've also just done a little bit of an interview with Phil, who owns the Beerheads brand. Uh, he started up a YouTube channel, believe it or not. So if you'd like to see a little bit more of that interview behind the scenes, then I'll leave a link in the description below for the official Beerheads YouTube channel. Check it out, folks, and I will see you for the vlog on Monday. Cheers.